today. So, do a little bit of uh, housekeeping. I want you all to stand up and stretch your legs and arms and get just get comfortable this morning. Those of you who are online at home, maybe go grab a cup of coffee because what I want you to do in this moment is just get comfortable. Like stretch your legs because you're gonna be, you've been sitting a while and I want you to sit a little longer if that's all right. Is that okay? Can we, we'll be able to sit a little longer. We got our legs stretched out, our hamstrings, you know, get the little stretch. All right, you can be seated. That was not for any sermon illustration other than I want you to be comfortable this morning. So hopefully you got your coffee, took your bathroom break, all those things. This morning, I'm a little bit excited, just a little bit. And if you can't tell, my energy level is a little up. A little jittery. Maybe the coffee worked this morning. Maybe the food worked this morning. But we are in a process this morning. Or sorry, we've been in a process of this idea of being restored. And what does that look like? And when we started this months ago, Daniel prayed for the nation of Israel. And we talked about our passions and our desires, having preparations and a plan and allowing God to work through those situations and moments. And last week, we looked at needing everyone as a part of the body of Christ. In the task in Nehemiah, no one seemed qualified. No one seemed to have the proper masonry skills. But they went and started moving in the direction of the vision. Nehemiah 2, 18b, they replied, let us start rebuilding so they began this good work. God raised up a leader who was unqualified. Why would God choose a cupbearer to rebuild Jerusalem? God brings a group of people into unity. When the vision is presented, they all work together for the common cause. And it seems like to this point that everything is moving in a proper direction. Not a whole lot to do. It's, here's the vision. All right, let's go do it. But what happens when you think you have the whole vision figured out, the plan, with the people on board, and someone comes in and challenges that vision? Some would say, are you opposed to the vision? This is, this is why I wanted you to stretch, because this might get a little bit uncomfortable. But what I want to start off by saying this morning is we have to start in that place of being on the same team. Much like the Israelites in Nehemiah chapter 3, where they all got together and did all the work. Much like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. So our expectations, even in disagreement, should be that we are on the same team. Opposition is what we're talking about. But our expectations, even in disagreement, should be that we build each other up, not tear each other down. That we respect each other, that we care for each other, and that we watch out for the well-being of one another. We're on the same team. And there's these two types of oppositions, and there's probably more variables with regard to what I'm trying to describe here. But there's the internal opposition, what happens inside the body of Christ. And there's an external opposition, which is outside the four walls or even outside us gathering as believers. And both can be, sometimes they can be helpful, sometimes they cannot. And part of our responsibility is to discern in these situations of opposition, whether it's helpful, meaning constructive criticism, or harmful, somebody's just trying to tear us down. In either case, whether it is external or internal opposition, the problem becomes, and I think we're all familiar with this to some degree, the us and them mentality. Me versus you. And we dig ourselves into these situations. And I want to bring up two 
illustrations of how our church has functioned in the past with regard to opposition. And I know, again, this is going to get a little bit uncomfortable, but I want you to hear the purpose behind it. I asked uh, the first one, and I wasn't even alive then, so I asked our historian, Bill Probasco, to help me out with this. Our church went through a split in the 1970s. And I want to read the words that Bill put together for me. Not all of them, but some, because it kind of spin this in a very interesting Bill-esque way. He says this, let's travel back to the close of the summer of love, the decade of the 60s, Vietnam, and the dawn of the disco decade. So, a lot like Bill, for those of you who know him. For the longest time, this is how he describes what happened then. I was told that a group within the church became interested in more expressive worship. They enjoyed clapping and speaking in tongues. It sounds like that it was a fad or a hot topic that spread around the country. So it wasn't just at Shiloh. And I don't know if it was said within the congregation, but the feeling was that if you weren't into that, you were sort of dead spiritually. He continues, the, those that would eventually leave Shiloh thought that, excuse me, would leave thought Shiloh was spiritually dead for not being more charismatic. And those that stayed felt the group that caused problems, over-worshipped, looked down on the rest of us, not as holy as we are. Sounds like opposition to me. Sounds like we're butting heads at a very deep and real level. Sounds like we didn't handle it very well. The second from our history comes from the year 2013, more recent. This is when the church went through this similar situation of opposition. And it was in regard to the community center and the purchase of the old noisy property. Two groups of people were on two opposite sides of the vision. And this is my recollection of that. Some things got so heated that each group even expressed in those moments that it must be God's will to either do or not do. Opposition. It's a real thing and it's prevalent in our body. It's, it's around the country. You can see this when you watch the news. Democrat versus Republican. Yeah. We're fighting a battle. And while for us today, I might have misrepresented some of those facts. The point I want to make with these things and this is where I get this from, Sharon Campbell, we are on the same team. If we haven't looked at our past history and said, we did it wrong then, now we need to do it better, the starting place is we are on the same team. We can accomplish great and many things when we aren't fighting against ourselves. So where do we start? Sandy pointed it out. We all love Jesus. We're all at that place, and we want to do our best for him. We all want to see our world and lives transformed by the message of the gospel. So that regardless of the methodology, the how those things are accomplished, we hold on to those truths. This means that whether we like clapping or speaking in tongues, we're on the same team. This means that when we start picking sides, we have already lost because we forgot that us as a body are on the same team. And as I said last week, your role in the vision is to not be excluded. It doesn't matter if you are far away from us or in person. Your gifts and abilities that you currently have do not disqualify you. The vision, the execution of the vision takes everyone. So we need to be on guard when opposition comes. We need to be able to discern when opposition is trying to help or when the opposition is trying to hinder and stop what God has called us to do. So the reason one could be opposed to a vision is maybe we haven't bought into that vision. 
Well, what is said maybe doesn't align with the way we think. Maybe what is said doesn't align with our world view. And even in the church, we can still have a world view. We can still view things the way the world does. Not different, but like they do. Us versus you. Maybe what is said doesn't align with who we think we are. Maybe we believe that there are certain gifts and abilities that are better than others. Paul addressed that. Maybe we're in opposition to a vision when we don't like the leader who has brought forth that vision. For whatever reason, maybe we have a different criticism of that person. Maybe they don't communicate well. Maybe they don't dress appropriately. This becomes a personal thing, and we disqualify the person leading because we don't like the person leading. This one's interesting. Maybe we are opposed to a vision that God presents or that somebody presents because we don't understand the vision. That can happen. But instead of asking for clarification, we simply oppose. Instead of making sure we understand the details, we shut down because it takes work to understand. We'd rather sometimes choose to be on somebody else's side than focus on what is true, right, and good. And like I said, that's the title. I didn't say this, but the title of today's message is When Opposition Comes. And the question we are asking ourselves today is how should we respond when opposition comes? And notice I didn't say if. It's when, because we know when we start doing things God's way, there are both going to be people internal and possibly external that are going to be opposed to what God wants to do. So not if it happens, but when. And when we, now we're going to get into our scripture, and I apologize it's taken this long, but that's how, we had to set this up, how I had to set this up this morning. But for our story of Nehemiah, opposition comes in several ways, and we're going to look at those today, how we would normally respond to those situations, and how Nehemiah responded in those situations. And the first one comes in Nehemiah 2, 17 to 20, if you want to join me there. Nehemiah 2, 17 to 20. No sooner had Nehemiah presented the vision to the Israelites, where they all said, let us rebuild, so they began the good work, then this piece of opposition happens. Nehemiah 2, 17 to 20. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. 18, I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. Verse 19, watch this. But when... Right? Not if it happened, but when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard about this, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing? They asked. Are you rebelling against the king? So Nehemiah answers, the God of heaven will give us success. We are his servants. We start rebuilding. But as for you? You have no share in Jerusalem or any claim to or historic right to it. So at the presentation of the vision, three people sit opposed to the vision. So what is that vision? What is that opposition? The opposition in this case is simply asking the question, why? What do they say? What, what is this you are doing? Oh, another way to say that. Why are you, why are you building this temple up? This is where it gets challenging for us because when we are hurt, when somebody tells us or asks us, why are you doing something? What is our typical response to that? For me, sometimes it's that I act in frustration. It's like, why are you even asking me that thing? 
Why are you challenging me in that way? I had the vision figured out. I knew what I was supposed to do and what I was supposed to accomplish. So when somebody comes and says, well, why are you doing that thing? It stresses me out. Let's be honest. It's our typical response. And it's almost like we're saying, I, I, I should say me. How dare you question what I believe God has called me to do? Right? That's what we want to do. That's how we respond typically to the question, why? Discernment. We started talking about that. We need that. To know whether this why is to help us or help them, because maybe they need clarification, or is it a hindrance as it is in this case in Nehemiah? So what should our response be? Let's be honest. Maybe we just need to mature. Right? Maybe we, need to, maybe we need to mature past the initial criticism. Is the opposition constructive or is the opposition a distraction? But if we mature to the place of somebody asking us why and not trying to like really dig at us in that moment, if we mature, then maybe we can respond like Nehemiah did. He answered them by saying, God will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding, but as for you, you'll have no share in Jerusalem or any claim to this historic right. Sounds pretty harsh, but think about it the way, so the way I'm thinking about him responding here is more like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, we're doing this thing over here. We're going to go and get this done, and God said we're going to do it, and we're going to make it work, and, but hey, if you don't want to be a part of this thing that God is doing here, hey, that's all right. That's Okay. We know what we've been called to do, right? Nehemiah knows what he's been called to do. And I think that's a place of maturity that he's speaking out of. It's like, yeah, okay, this is happening. We're going to build this thing. We're going to do this thing. And if you don't want a part of that, that's okay too. Doesn't change the relationship with the person yet. So when we get that question, that op the opposition question of why, we should respond in maturity. We should grow up a little bit. And know that not every question of why is a shot at us to, to get us to stop. But a question of why might just need some clarity. Some clarifications. Nehemiah was 100% certain that the vision he had was from God. He's full of confidence at this point. So it doesn't matter the question of why. He can mature past that question. And responds in kind. Eh, no big deal. But it continues. More opposition comes. Chapter 4. If you want to turn there, starting in verse 1. Same people. Still stirring up problems. It says this, when Sambalot heard that we were rebuilding the wall, right? This is after the initial response and that they were going forward with the plans of God. They realized, okay, maybe we need to step it up a notch. What happens to Sambalot? He became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? So his buddy jumps in, verse 3. Tobi the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What are they building? Even a fox climbing up on it can break down those walls of stone. Nehemiah responds, Hear us, our God, for our, we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight. For they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till it, all of it reached half his height. For the people worked with all their heart. 
Verse 7, but when Sambalot and Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs of Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and there were gaps and the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. There's two oppositions here that take place. And the first one is in that first few verses, the open ridicule amongst a larger group of people. So if you recall in chapter two, there's only these three guys standing opposed. And what they are doing now, the tactic has changed. And now they're in the presence, verse 2, of his associates and an army of Samaria. This is like saying something loud enough in a group of people that will pique the interest of those around. It's like, they're doing this thing and we think it's bad, so let's stir this up amongst a greater group of people. It's like, a, <laughs> the illustration here is, is, have you familiar with the term gaper delay? What is the gaper delay? It's when you have to drive by a car accident and stop or somebody's on the side of the road and stare and look to see what's going on. And that, what that does in turn slows down the rest of the traffic. That's what they're trying to do in this moment is create this big scene to stir up more people against. And watch that. He's bringing the army of Samaria into it, a whole army of people. What is our typical response when somebody does that to us? Maybe we get or feel embarrassed. Right? Somebody's making a scene, and because we don't want the attention on ourselves, we maybe just walk away from that. Or maybe we respond like Nehemiah did. What does he do? Verses 4 and 5. Hear us, our God. He seeks God. He prays to God for guidance in the situation, in the moment. But I want to challenge our thinking here, because while we might think that's all good, watch how he prays. He prays, turn their insults back on them. Do not cover their guilt or blot out their sins. There's a problem with that prayer that I want to point out. Not that the prayer, praying to God is wrong. But there's this thing, a mentality, and it's throughout scripture called the retribution principle. And what that simply means is that if you are righteous, God will bless you. And if you are wicked, God will curse you. And we all can agree that that's true, right? If you've been in church long enough, you've heard something to that effect. The problem with that principle and just that line of thinking is it's incomplete. And Job is a perfect example of why that is incomplete. Because in Job chapter 1 verse 1, it says, In the land of Uz there lived a man whose name was Job... Watch this. This man was blameless and upright and feared God and shunned evil. He did all the right things, and yet we know in the story of Job that calamity still came upon him. Nothing stopped that from happening. Job was righteous, so by Job's standards, he should have been blessed by God. And yes, ultimately he was. But it's God that is the one that decides. That's why this retribution principle is incomplete. Not just that the righteous get blessed and the wicked get punished. It's that God can still have the authority to do what God chooses to do. It's not contingent upon what I have done or do. It's what God chooses. So he can choose to bless somebody who is wicked. Are you with me? He can choose to bless somebody who is wicked. We don't like to think in terms of that. We pray in that moment like Nehemiah, do not cover their guilt, do or blot them out. Basically, cause them to come to harm. That's a problem. Not that praying to God is the problem, but that how we pray and what we're praying for is the problem. The retribution principle. 
But what happens in Job after God challenges him with this thought? In Job 42, it says this, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of these things. Job's admitting his mistake. I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. To which Job says, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. The completion of that retribution principle, God can do what God wants to do, period. So when we pray out of the retribution principle, curse the wicked, curse those who are opposed to us. Hey God, you see they're wicked, you know they're wicked. That's an improper response. But what should our proper response be? I submit to you Matthew 5, verses 43 through 48. And it says this. This is Jesus talking at the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Hate those opposed to you. But I tell you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you might be children of your Father in heaven. Why is that? Because he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So what should our response be? Pray for those who persecute you. It's not condemnation. It's you pray that God gets a hold of them and, and moves in their lives. Yes, God can do what he wants. So our position in this is surrender and humility to God. God, you got to handle this. I know this is difficult. I know the enemies are great. I know the opposition is strong, but God, you have to do it. And that seems simple now because maybe there's only been this one moment where somebody challenged our thinking and why, and we've matured past that. And maybe in this moment that they're, they're still coming at us a little bit, but it's not that difficult yet. Maybe we don't even pray like that yet. But like I said, in that section comes again. Chapter 4, verse 7. But when Samblat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs of Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and the gaps were being closed... They were very angry. Their anger increased, right? They were just angry before. Now they're very angry. And what did they do? They all plotted together to come and fight Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. Wow. Now it's getting real. And what do we do in those moments? When we see that there's an army in front of us, so to speak, a group of people coming against us. What our typical response is in these moments is to dig on our heels, to rally our troops to our cause, and to charge forward. That sounds like a civil war to me. That sounds like bloodshed that's not necessary to me. All it says is they're prepared. They're coming against. They're ready to fight. These are the oppositional people. And instead of responding with grabbing our army, our people who are all on board with us, and digging in and going head to head, how should we respond? What did Nehemiah do? He adapted to his situation. 
He continued on the path that God had before him. He continued to lead the people of Israel to build the wall, but he adapted to the situation. Verse 9, but we prayed. Watch his prayers different. Or no, the prayer's not even posted here, but he adapted. Here it is. And they posted a guard day and night. They didn't rally the troops to defense and, and go charge out against. They just prepared themselves for battle. They said, this opposition's coming. I can see it clearly that it's coming. So I need to adapt. I need to do something different. I can't just focus on just rebuilding. Now I have to defend what's going on, right? This is, us, this is a different tactic than being in opposition to something or someone. Defense, right? It's like having the shield to guard you having the sword to protect you, but not having to go charge out and swing the sword. You have it, but the sword is, should be used as a defensive weapon, not as an offensive one. It's when the battle comes at you, now you have some way to defend against it. So Nehemiah formed a plan, and he posted the guards to keep watch. And maybe at this moment, some of you in this forms of opposition that come, maybe you need to adapt. Maybe you need to keep focused on the vision that God has placed, but be prepared for the attack against it. Defense. He set up a defense against it. So far, we've been asked why. An army has come against us. But what happens when it's continual, when it keeps coming? Turn with me, chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. And this is our final section of opposition that I want to point out to us this morning. And there are three types of opposition in this section. But it says this in chapter 6, verse 1. When the word came to Sambalot, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, notice how that group keeps growing. Now they're just ambiguous. There's a bunch of them, and they're all enemies. That I had rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates. Verse 2, Sambalot and Geshem sent this message to me. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages of the plain of Ono. Oh, but they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message. And each time I gave them the same answer. Then the fifth time, Sambalot sent his aid to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter, which was written. It is reported among the nations in Geshem, say it is true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king, and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is the king of Judah. Now this report will get back to the king, so come, let us meet together. Verse 8, I sent them this reply. Nothing like you are saying is happening. You just need, you're just making it up in your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. Three types of opposition. One is civility and conversation. See, they've tried to outright embarrass what was going on in Jerusalem in a big uh, sort of event to, to that gaper delay, so to speak. But now it's like, okay, that tactic didn't work. So the tactic has changed to being civil and conversational. So instead of ridicule, they act civil. 
hey, come just meet with us. It'll be a good thing. It won't be a problem. But let me say this. Discernment is so important because just because someone acts civil doesn't mean they aren't in opposition. See, it's easy sometimes to move past those people that are in our face and making a big scene of things, but it's hard when they're acting in such a civilized manner. Civility in conversation. The second, repetitive in nature, trying to wear you down. So this is not just being civil. It's become repetitive. People keep bringing things up over and over again in the hopes that it will wear down your resolve. Did God say it? Did God want that vision to happen? They keep coming and coming and coming and coming. The third, a flat out lie. So not only are they trying to be civil, not only are they coming at Nehemiah in this repetitive nature, but now they have flat out lied. And what we do typically in each of these situations, how do we respond to civility typically? When somebody is being nice and good and kind of pleasant with us? Maybe we give that person or we take that meeting. Maybe we miss out on the point that said, I saw that they were going to do something bad against me. And maybe we give in. And so sometimes civility or being civil or somebody being civil is a trap. And discernment is necessary in that moment. What is our typical response when something comes at us at a repeated nature? I love this story and I'm going to share it with you out of Judges 16 verses 15 to 17, talking about Samson. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when you will not confide in me? This is the third time you have made me a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. Watch this. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. So he gave in and told her everything. When something comes against us in this repeated nature, we sometimes respond the way Samson did and give in. What do we do typically when somebody has lied against us? That's a cause for us to rally our troops and just go take them out now. That's more than just, we're ready to, we're just grabbing that army, that, those people that are on the same side of us, and we're just going for it. You lied to my face and you did it. How should we respond? Basically, Nehemiah stands up to the lie. What you said isn't true. And sometimes maybe we need to confront that bully. That lie you're telling, it's not true. Right? Maybe we even say that for our own confidence. I know what they're saying isn't true about me. But what really happens and what I want us to see as kind of the final point here. Nehemiah prayed yet again. He says, now strengthen my hands. God, I can't fight this anymore. God, I've been looking at the opposition over and over coming against me. But now all you have to do, his position and his posture changed from looking at his opponent to a surrendering position to God. Now give me strength. As if he didn't need it before. Maybe he was too distracted in those moments. And maybe he handled himself well by moving past the questions of why. Maybe he handled himself well by, by adapting to the plan, not removing what the vision was, but adapting to a defensive position. But if through all of these situations and scenarios, the opposition wanted to bring Nehemiah to a place of defeat, 
to be worn down, to be so overwhelmed that he could not stand, to look at the vision that God has placed in his heart and not be able to carry it through. And I would say he did waver a little bit when he prayed, don't forget their sin. But when that opposition kept coming, when the opposition kept trying to drive him away from the plans of God, he committed himself to the Lord, strengthen my hands. It became internal between him and God instead of external into the responses of what was going on in front of him. So we might get frustrated. We might rally our troops to our cause. We might get worn down and give in. We might even dig our heels in when we are challenged. And remember how all of this started. For us, we've experienced times in our history where it was us and them. When it crept in and caused divisions. So there are two challenges that we need to process with this message this morning. First, am I being like Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem? Am I opposed to the vision that God has laid out? And am I trying to divide instead of unify? Am I not really understanding the vision and unwilling to ask questions? Do I simply not like the person leading? Am I like Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem? Or am I responding to the opposition the way Nehemiah did in the face? Discernment comes in. Is it being constructive or just criticism? Do I really need to rally my troops to my cause or simply in humility, God give me strength? When the opposition comes, not if. Hopefully, hopefully this is a helpful for us this morning. And what I want to say before we conclude is that it's hard when we're opposed. It's hard then when we don't see the truth of what's in front of us. It's hard when the vision is challenged. But as we said last week, it takes everyone. But when that internal or external opposition comes, our ultimate response should be, God, give me strength. I know you got this. I know you've given me a vision and a direction. I know you want to do some big and mighty things in me and through me. So God, give me strength. So this is how we should respond when the opposition comes. Starting from a place we are on the same team, but knowing that it will come that we can stand firm, that we can lean into all that God has for us in confidence and like the confidence of Nehemiah. 